Hello, hello, hello. Welcome. I'm so excited to everybody to be here. Welcome to FITM's online lecture series. Um, we are featuring today the changing landscape for launching beauty products. Um, I am Tina Perez. I am the director of the AA and Bachelor of Science um, program here at FITM. The programs are beauty marketing and product development, as well as the beauty business management. Um, those programs are focused on basically teaching students about where they um, they learn how to become part of this very exciting and ever-changing and dynamic industry. And that's what we're going to be talking today is how the industry is changing. Um, there's a lot of assumptions that the industry is changing only from COVID, but it isn't. It's changing from a lot more reasons than that. So we're going to talk about that. But the way we're going to do it is I'm going to have four of our FITM alum, if you ladies want to join me, um, who are the epitome and the proof of how our alum and, and how the program can prepare students to enter this industry in very different ways with very different opportunities um, and so I am going to introduce them to you tell you a little bit about your, their path and how they got here um, the format today is I will introduce them then I will ask each one of them a question about a, a certain section of the industry and how it's changing and each one will address though that individually and then we're just going to kind of go for a free for all when we were um, meeting last week to talk about this. The dynamics between these four women was so fabulous that I'm like, okay, I don't need to do any work here. I'm just going to ask a few questions and then watch them kind of feed off of each other and um, learn just by that kind of observation. However, it, because of that, that also means we have a great opportunity for you to put things in the chat, put things in the Q and A. Um, if you have a question, I do really recommend that you do the Q&A. That's probably where we'll see the question a lot better than we'll see it in the chat. And then uh, what I want to do at the end is, you know, give 15 minutes for that Q&A so that you as an audience can also be part of this and learn from this because that's sort of the intention here, right? It's our lecture series so that you're learning something um, and hopefully you're learning something that besides the fact that we're all super excited about the beauty industry. So um, with that said, do allow me to introduce to you our panelists. I'm going to start with Jasmine. Jasmine is the product development manager at Former Brands, which those of you who don't know, Former Brands owns Morphe and Morphe 2. So Jasmine does work on Morphe 2. She's been there about two years now. Jasmine kind of did the meandering path to get to into the beauty industry. She worked in insurance for five years, um, and I, I guess that just wasn't exciting enough industry for her. I don't know why not, Jasmine, but, you know, she then at that point decided to become a certified makeup artist, which um, I think at that point, too, she probably did a little more research and she found the FITM program. And so she entered FITM um, after becoming the certified makeup artist as she entered it into the AA of Beauty Marketing and product development. When she graduated, she landed uh, her first job with Wet n Wild, which is near and dear to my heart because that's where I worked before I was at FITM. Um, and she was at Wet n Wild for five years. She moved up from an entry-level coordinator position and went straight through to senior manager of complexion and new product innovation, which then led her to, as I mentioned, uh, former brands of Morphe. So thank you, Jasmine. Welcome. I'm super excited to have you here. Um, you're going to start to see a little bit of a running theme here, people, because now I'm going to introduce you to Melissa. Uh, and Melissa, I'm going to, I was about to say your last name, and I'm not going to, because I'm going to get it wrong. So Melissa, and she's the marketing manager at NYX Makeup at L'Oreal. So um, she's been there for quite quite a few years now. She actually also got her AA um, in beauty marketing and product development right along with Jasmine. So they were in school together. And then lo and behold, coincidentally, it seems they both went to Marquins together. So they both started there. Um, Melissa was the marketing coordinator for Wet n Wild for six years. She moved while well, she was with them for six years. She moved up from a marketing coordinator to a senior brand marketing manager. And what's cool, if you can catch the titles I was talking about, is even though they both graduated from the program with the beauty marketing and product development degree, Jasmine went product development, 
route with Marquins, where um, Melissa went the marketing route with Marquins. And so they both ended up in sort of same company, same brand, but with different missions, which has then led them now to different roles at different companies, um, slightly different bent. So, um, you know, so yeah, Melissa, you've been with Nick since 2019, so pretty good. But now I also want to introduce you to Sophia. Sophia is the marketing and brand architect for a company called Hatch Beauty Brands. Those of you who are kind of digging into the industry and doing your research, you know who Hatch is. And those of you who are just sort of out there, you're like, who? So Hatch is actually an incubator for brands. So people who have ideas, who don't have the background or the knowledge or the expertise to launch it, will go to Hatch and have them help them launch it and bring to market. So she has been with Hatch, I think, since... Um, five years, right? Just over fat hatch of five years. So she actually has what we call the professional designation degree. She has a PD degree, which means that um, Sophia came to FITM already having a bachelor's degree in history. Yeah, not a way to get into the beauty industry, was it? No, not Sophia. So, so what Sophia figured out can't get into the beauty industry with a with a history degree. So she came and did the one nine month program, um, the professional designation in beauty marketing and product development, which led her to getting a position with Physicians Formula as a marketing merchandising assistant. With lo and behold, if Marquins, who owns Wet and Wild, didn't also own Physicians Formula, so these three crossed over um, their paths in a number of places. And then um, she had been after Physicians Formula, she moved over to Hatch, where she is marketing and PR coordinator, which is where she started. And she is now manager of marketing and brand development. So welcome, Sophia. Thank you. And then last but never least, Taryn Aronson. Taryn is the founder of Totally Taryn Social. Taryn did get her AA from FIDM um, in beauty marketing and product development. And then she went on to get her Bachelor of Arts at UCLA. She was sort of right there when the indie brands exploded into LA. She was in the market right at the right time. And she did, um, you know, she did product development for Urban Decay, Smashbox, Too Faced, and really pioneered a lot of what was happening in the industry at that time. Um, and then kind of started to make a shift when the industry made a shift. And she moved over to director of social media and community for Josie Moran and really caught the bug of social media and that whole future. And that passion for that, combined with her passion for clean, um, cruelty-free, and socially conscious brands, has led her to creating her own agency during COVID, where she specializes in doing social media for brands that are truly socially conscious focused um, in all categories, not just in beauty. And Taryn also has uh, come back to FITM as an instructor in beauty marketing product development and also in the digital marketing program. So um, we, we don't let our, our alumni get far, you know, and, and they always come back and give back. So Taryn, thank you very much for participating in this as well. All right, I'm super excited to have all four of you here and um, let's just get started. So the way that that's working is we're gonna address these changes, the changing landscape from sort of four perspectives. So I'm gonna ask each of the women here a question regarding that different perspective in the industry. And we'll kind of let them get that going and get the juices flowing. So my first question is for Jasmine. And so Jasmine, you know, you do product development and that's your background, that's been your passion. So we know that things have shifted or we know that, that, that there's been a change, especially when all of a sudden you find yourself doing your job from home, in, in how to determine the right products to bring to market for your brand in terms of like product mix, formulations, ingredients, packaging, pricing. I mean, when you entered the industry, you know, six, seven years ago for Wet and Wild, it was a very different industry. So talk to me a little bit about then, you know, the changes and the evolutions and the shifting trends that you consider have been the most, the biggest or the most recent shift that has changed what you do. Um, thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, um, before COVID happened, um, I think the entire industry was starting to shift into a more clean, vegan, it was kind of around 
few brands were doing it and a lot of brands were catching on. And I think that having COVID at the forefront definitely made everyone more conscious and be more health minded. And I think the brands saw that and as an, as an opportunity and really just ran with it. And I'm sure you guys have all seen it. Um, most brands are now vegan or they're going to be vegan or they're claiming that they're clean or they have some products that are somewhat along those lines. So it's no longer, um, you know, it's now like kind of, it's a thing that brands now, it's it's not an afterthought. It's mm -hmm. what how brands are being uh, launched and developed. Um, all of these, um, when I am developing a product, um, all of those things are at top of mind. When I was brought over to Morphe 2, um, the brand did not exist. I, there was no name to the brand. They just told me, you know, we want to uh, basically, uh, our target consumer is going to be the Gen Z. And what do they care about? You know, they care about, you know, clean, uh, vegan, cruelty-free, sustainable, refillable, all of those things. So, um, for me and my brand, I think we were already hitting the nail on the head. And um, I think everyone else has been following the trend. All right, so big focus then you're saying is that the biggest change for you is that change that we see, the movement over to clean, to sustainable, to cruelty-free. I mean, you mentioned it's clean and cruelty-free. I said sustainable. Is that valid too, that now brands are also really worrying about packaging and so not just formulation? I mean, is, is it going yeah. soup to nuts? Yeah, totally. So packaging cannot be an afterthought at this point. Um, I think that most brands are trying to figure out a way to make their packaging more uh, sustainable. And I always use a, an example nowadays when Monet kind of took off in the last year, year and a half while we were stuck at home. I was very intrigued by them. I was like, their marketing was kind of, you know, great. Um, I think they, uh, they really caught my attention. And one of their big message was like, you know, toxic free and, and, and also, you know, all of these brands that say toxic free, it, the, you know, we, we, that, us that are in the industry, we need to make sure we we know that these things are not true. Like there's no such thing as toxic free. Like every ingredient at a certain level could be toxic. So uh, back to Monet, Monet was really pushing the chemical free and, you know, toxic free and all of that. So I ordered some other products and, you know, I ordered their hair care stuff. It was okay. And then I ordered their skincare stuff. And that's where I, I truly was disappointed because, mm -hmm their packaging was so clunky, full of plastic, um, electroplated. And actually when I was over at Wet n Wild, I mean, I'm talking about maybe four years ago, we were already uh, moving away from electroplating. And if you guys don't know what that is, it's like the metalized looking type of packaging. And that creates so much um, hazard to our environment that even at Wet n Wild four years ago, we were moving away from it. And even in China, there's, there's actual regulations that you know, factories were getting shut down if they were manufacturing these products um, with this type of packaging. So I was like, you know, it just doesn't make sense. So, you know, it, the, the concept of toxic free, chemical free, great for, for you, but not for the environment. So I feel that, you know, um, all of the brands now are trying to figure out the best way to do it. And also it trying to figure it, figure out how to do it with cost in mind because and also there's so much room for these manufacturers to pivot and find new ways to actually create more sustainable packaging and right now the problem is that these things are super expensive so I feel that most brands are trying to find a way to get there but it's going to be very challenging and whoever does it and does it right um, I think will win. All right, cool. Great. I've got a million questions that came up from that, but I'm going to save them. So um, I'll get to each so I can get to each person a little bit, and then we'll go straight into all my millions of questions. All right. So Melissa, um, basically, we there's also been this shift, not now, you know, Jasmine talked about it from more of a packaging product formulation perspective, but how and where products are sold to consumers or, or how consumers want to buy, because they're different sometimes, right? That has shifted. And there seems to be the theory it's because of COVID 
Do you agree with that? Or do you think it, it was happening before or something else has shifted since? You know, I think that it, COVID really forced marketing for us to accelerate our digital plan five years in advance. So for us, I would say it was the key word that we've all been using. It was all about adapting. And we really had to adapt in like three different phases, I would say, um, in terms of marketing and being where the consumer is at. So COVID had happened. Store closures were done. No one was really kind of speaking about makeup. So how are we really going to target our consumers and really speak to them about our products? Well, we had to develop this quote unquote escapism, right? This kind of experiential thing where they could learn about our new product launches while, um, as well as our brand through our social platforms, through our D2C. Um, you know, you didn't have the luxury of going in store and kind of looking and swatching, you know, at an Ulta. So we really had to bring that forth through our social platforms and our digital platforms. And then I would say the next phase that we all saw, and I know everyone wakes up and checks TikTok in the morning for that quote unquote hashtag, TikTok made me buy it. We saw that, you know, as COVID restrictions were starting to, you know, lesson with the whole TikTok made me buy it. What was entering, what was interesting to us is they weren't necessarily swiping up and buying on D2C. They were getting in their car. Yeah, D2C. D direct to consumer, our own.com. <laughs> I'm talking in my acronyms today. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we saw is they were getting in their cars, driving to Ulta, driving to Target, grabbing their little goodie bags and filming product reviews in their car. So I think what it showed us is that, yes, we are, you know, in a digital age where direct to, uh, from D to C, direct to consumer is so prevalent, but in-store presence has such like brand equity and that experience for consumers that it's just going to continue to grow further and further. Okay, so it, you, you can't be singular channel anymore, right? That's the omni channel at this point. You kind of having to play everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. And then the third phase, which we're in right now, I'll just briefly touch upon is really returning to stores and how do we infuse both that phase one and phase two of that digital presence with also in store. So, okay. All right, great. Mm -hmm. Well, again, a million questions and I'll get to them. <laughs> so, all right, Sophia, what I kind of want to talk to you about, have you talked to us about then is, you know, how then and, and where are brands and products positioning themselves in the market, right? We, we've had the newer indie brands, the ones I was saying that Taryn worked for, you know, that kind of pioneered the whole indie revolution. And then we have the clear indie brands that are pioneering that. And then, of course, we have the big time incumbents who haven't gone anywhere. I mean, they're still there. They're still huge. So, you know, well, who's what's the right way to position yourself in the market these days? Or how has that changed? How do you see that playing? Happy to be here and great insight from everyone. I think one of the biggest changes that I've seen right now, it's um, currently the shift for both newer indie brands and iconic brands that have been around for decades are looking to align themselves with positioning attributes. Some that um, Jasmine, I believe, and Melissa have already touched upon, you know, being vegan, cruelty-free, clean beauty, and planet positive. That initiative is huge, especially because Sephora is leading that. But from a more of a social standpoint, brands are also looking to align themselves with things that are relevant and disruptive as well, such as being inclusive, diverse, non-binary, gender neutral, and socially conscious. I think this shift kind of started about five years ago, at least working in my organization, Hatch Beauty, we really saw this shift in this momentum after the whole climate speech in 2018 from um, Greta Thunberg and also the subsequent social um, current events that have taken place and really disruptive our consciousness. I think um, indie brands like Thrive Cosmetics about face beauty and Fenty Beauty are really leading the charge and setting an example for social consciousness and changing the game for inclusivity. It's It, it has become much more than featuring a male with full face of makeup. Um, they have really become pioneers in changing the face of beauty by holding space for creative beauty, no matter what you choose to identify yourself with, whether you're looking for cruelty-free, vegan, um, sustainability, whatever you identify and align your lifestyle with, brands are really being mindful of really um, elevating that experience for consumers. So they're just, it's kind of like, 
brands are finding a way to align with consumers' beliefs and philosophies and preferences, right? And, and putting a, a stake in the ground is sort of what you're saying? Exactly. Aligning with the cost that, that um, really helps elevate either their, their heritage and really um, amplifying their legacy. Perfect example, Lancome and, and um, Estee Lauder are really um, aligning with those goals of um, environmental initiatives and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I find that interesting too, just that the majors actually have way more power to do this. And yet everybody thinks it's the indies that, you know, or the reason it's happening. And yet the majors are the ones like, Oof, they're making big changes. But anyway, oh, I'm digressing. Okay, <laughs> let me come back. <laughs> I don't want to, I'll get there. All right. It's so hard not to want to just. <laughs> All right. Now, Taryn. So, Taryn, as you know, we talked about, right, you know, social. Um, but we're going to kind of focus on that as this as this way that brands now can meet, create awareness and promote themselves, because I think that's just the number one way that's happening. But it's different, right? I mean, social's been around for quite a while. And yet, do you think that social has gone through a pivot? Is there a significant, what's the big, the way brands create awareness and promote themselves and their products on social? What's the change been there? Gosh, well, there's been a few different changes. I think um, first, you know, this was sort of happening before COVID, but really the shift away from like, you know, giant influencers and more into looking at more niche influencers, macro, micro influencers, and people just kind of you know, moving away from it only being what Kim Kardashian tells them to buy. Mm -hmm. But through COVID, I think the flip that brands really had to contend with, and, and definitely it was a flip that really inspired me to pivot, um, you know, the kinds of brands that I wanted to work with um, in 2020, was that consumers just started really asking questions and asking brands to step up. And I think everyone's kind of touched on this um, in their respective areas. But you know, all of a sudden it was like, okay, great. You're, you say that you're interested in diversity and inclusivity. And yeah, I see that you threw a few different people on your feed this month, but like, what does that actually mean? Who's sitting down at the table? Who has a seat at the table at your organization? Um, so the pull up or shut up movement that happened that really like beauty had to reveal their numbers and brands had to come to the table and say, okay, this is the breakdown of who works um, at the company and, and not just who works in customer service, you know, who actually is in a position of power at the organization and, and can affect change within the organization. So I think that was the first time that I really saw on mass in that way in beauty that customers had the ability to force brands into stepping up um, in a really, really large way. And um, that was that was interesting for me to watch because I had I had clients that were like willing to do it and wanted to do it and were excited by that. And then, you know, there were clients that were like, oh, you know, how do we back away from this? How do we hide from this? And I think what we all learned in the last year is like, you can't hide from it. Um, so you can't you can't wait till you're called out. You need to be ready um, and have good practices in place so that when the questions are asked, you have answers that today's consumer finds acceptable. No, I agree. I think that's the thing, right? When the questions are asked. I don't, I think a lot of brands used to be able to hide and not have the questions asked. It wasn't a forum for the question to be asked, right? It wasn't a way for it to become quite so front and center. And if it was written in a letter or whatever, or an email, nobody knew anybody asked it. We just ignored it. We're going to pretend we didn't get it. Now it's like right there, right? It's right there. It's in front of everybody's face that this question was asked and you either didn't or did answer it. And how are you going to answer it? And I, I think you're correct, right? Brands have to be prepared to answer those questions or up front and try to answer them before they even come forward. Yeah, Even better. And I think um, just to kind of add on to that, I, I pulled some stats for everybody because okay. I love, I love. Well, you're a teacher. Numbers. I know it. <laughs> Um, but I think in addition to what you're saying, Tina, the reason is also that the consumer changed what they expect to, right? Um, you know, when I was at Urban Decay in 2000, and that was a different world where like what people were looking for from indie brands at that point was, do you have colors that Estee Lauder doesn't have? Like that was how you were different was, do you have black nail polish? You know, now you can find black nail polish anywhere. It's not a point of difference. It hasn't been a point of difference for decades. Um, you, we've kind of been talking about this, like saying you're clean, cruelty-free, sustainable, all of those are just becoming like every brand says they are. So that's not really like a strong enough point of difference either anymore. But so some fun stats, these are not specific to beauty. These are just like, you know, the American consumer in general, but 79% of us believe that companies should work to address social justice needs. 
That's most of us. Mm -hmm. And 78% of Americans believe that it's not okay for a company to just make money. They really expect the company is giving back, doing something in the world. But the ones that, you know, maybe are a little more important for those of us that are trying to make money is that 68% of Americans are willing to spend more on a socially conscious brand. So the expectation is there that we're doing something about what's happening in the world. And if we are doing something and we're willing to talk about it and we're willing to kind of stand up for our values, mm -hmm. um, they're willing to give us more money to do it. So it's, it's kind of a no brainer. And I think we entered a time where it's no longer about like, oh, it's just the ethical right thing to do. It's, it's a magic moment where what's the ethical right thing to do is also the right thing to do from a marketing perspective. Okay. All right, well, so then I'm gonna start just throwing some questions um, some observations and then you guys can also share just share your observations and things too but every one of you actually said that your change started to take place before COVID that you saw it happening before then and yet you know everybody I know credits COVID with changing the world and everything we do right what was it that was COVID just the accelerator of it? Do you think it would have happened anyway? Or do you think it wasn't even COVID? Do you think it was sort of like the Black Lives Matter movement and the, and, you know, um, the Me Too movement? I mean, what is it, if it was happening five years ago and we still don't have it right, what's making it so apparent now? And are we getting better? Anybody, jump in. I'll do it even though I just spoke. I think it accelerated. Um, we were all sitting glued to our phones and our screens. Okay. Uh, we didn't have the distractions that we normally have. These were issues that were already important. The numbers I read you were actually pre-COVID numbers. So they're even stronger now. This was just the last time a study of that magnitude was done mm -hmm. was pre-COVID. So it, it was a time where we couldn't look away anymore. Um, you know, we, we really... And we were talking to our customers more directly because like everyone's, you know, sort of talked about social media was already important, but now that was kind of the main driver where everyone was like, okay, we got it. We got to connect. We got to connect. We got to connect. So we were just, we were, we were hearing more from yeah. our consumers and people couldn't really turn away as much as they maybe used to when their lives were more whole. To, I think Jasmine, I think back when, you know, when, when I was first trying to do this, right, it was hard. It was really hard to find vendors. It was really hard to find suppliers who would be clean, would be green, would do sustainable plastic. I mean, you know, I remember when I was still working in product development and I was like, oh, I would like to have a recycled plastic. And they're like, well, that, oh, yeah, well, there aren't many of us that do that. Has that shifted a lot? Have you found that that's kind of now there's just more and more vendors who are able to provide what we need? Uh, no, there's still, I, I think we're not there yet. Um, there, there was one, actually, I saw them when I was still at Marquins. There was uh, a component that they showed us that was made out of only uh, uh, things that you can find on earth. So like wood and they were mixed and the actual component could only be a certain color, which was earth tones because it was really just made with natural products. But it was so expensive. It was ridiculously expensive. And I actually brought it up at my, you know, at my new brand and like still very expensive. And I'm talking to you about maybe four years ago. So I think there's still a lot of room for, you know, I, I mean, I'm just saying whoever can break it and figure out a way like these manufacturers to really um, create products that or, or packaging that is truly, truly sustainable, truly, you know, because I feel like, you know, the, the word is thrown around so loosely now. And I feel that, you know, the brands need to hunker down and really, you know, take a true, transparent route and figure out a way how to do it. Yeah. yeah. So, Melissa, do you think this change came from the consumer first, which went to the brand, who then went to the vendors and the suppliers? Or do you think it's like... I think it definitely is that consumer. I think even before COVID, what we were realizing as a brand is this surgence of that Gen Z consumer and their authority and their voice in the beauty space. And so to the point where we're having retailers such as Target, Ulta, and Walmart saying, how are we speaking to this consumer? How are you as a brand really differentiating yourself to really kind of target this consumer and bringing them into our stores? So I think it's really, it started with the consumer and then, you know, to the, to the point where it really goes into the products that we're putting out. Is it really speaking to them? You know, it's not just, um, it's a, it's a demand now. 
right? It's not like a, a nice to have, it's a demand to have inclusivity and all that. So, and sustainability within our products as well as what we stand for too, so. So the thing is, we know that this industry is incredibly fickle, right? The beauty industry is probably one of the most fickle industries I've ever run into. And trends come and they come out huge. I mean, let's talk contouring, let's talk eyebrows, let's talk, you know, and then they're big and then they, whew, away they go. Is this going to go away? Is this a trend or is this a bigger shift? It's a huge shift for sure. Okay. It's a huge shift. It's here to stay. Um, I don't think we can look away from it. I don't think this is a trend that's going to go away. It's not a trend. I think, um, and to follow what Melissa was saying, how these retailers are asking brands to really uh, differentiate themselves and figure out a way to really call out the, you know, what they're doing to be socially conscious. And I think, you know, first it was just, a, you know, a thought like, yeah, let's be recyclable, let's be this, but now it's initiatives, promises and dates, timelines. Um, I think that for all brands, I feel like that is truly important for everyone to, um, to, to stay on top of, of what's happening. I mean, Sophia, do you think though that um, brands have to pivot? So there's this feeling, there's certain brands that I perceive and I see them pivoting because they have to, but it doesn't really feel like, like it wasn't part of their DNA or it wasn't really important, but now it's important because it's the thing you got to do. And then there's brands that it has been part of their DNA. I mean, which do you think we're looking at? Are we looking at more like the, the ones where it is part of their DNA? Is that rare? Or do you think, do you think it's genuine? Or do you think peak brands are just doing this because they have to? I think it's part of a new um, wave of social consciousness, whether it was part of their DNA and their original playbook of brand development or if it's a heritage brand that's really leaning into leading the charge and really using their scale for good. Um, I think it, it's it's gonna become the gold standard, whether it's part of your original DNA or if it's really the way of, of an evolution of an iconic um, longstanding brand. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's talk kind of like brass tactics. How has these changes, any, any of them, changed your jobs? in the last, you know, five years or whatever. I mean, and for the better, for the worse, tell me a good story, tell me a bad story. You know, what's something you've had to do in your career to pivot, to adjust to this? I think it's made my job a lot more enjoyable. It, it creates and holds space for authentic synergy um, because not only can I take my creative inspiration for something tan tangible, but also signals from something that's meaningful. Like after all, we're just not creating beautiful products. You know, we're creating experiences. We're creating things that are meaningful, that are impactful. And also we're, we're, we're looking to thrive together to, as people and for the planet. So I, I feel like those things are very important and it's really, really changed the way I, I look at things from ideation all the way into market. So definitely um, has changed a lot. Cool. Melissa, what about you, Nix? I wouldn't say it was in DNA's, uh, Nix's DNA. So, you know, how are you guys doing this? And I know you're doing it in a meaningful mm -hmm. way. I know it's a huge part of your initiative, but how hard is that? It is because we really want to truly speak to you, like as a brand, being authentic, right? And really holding that in our forefront. You know, we are LA pro artistry and that is within our brand DNA, but not a lot of people, you know, really grew up. So like thinking that Gen Z consumer, they're just kind of being introduced to it now. So it has been, you know, I'm going to say the word again, we've had to really adapt the way that we're speaking to our consumers. And then even now, one of my challenges, but you know, it's great because it really does force us to think in a new way is with the introduction of Ulta going into Target. Mm -hmm. You know, realistically, when looking at those two consumer profiles, they're very different. You have your beauty savvy junkie at Ulta, and then at Target still too, you, you do have that, but you also have, you know, you're in there, you go in there and you get hypnotized by that circle and you end up going into the beauty section, the home section, the coffee, like it's not just, you know, you're shopping directly for beauty. So with this whole introduction, it's how are we speaking to them? What products are we putting forth in there? You know, that really kind of speaks to both profiles. So it's been challenging, but you know, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. Taryn, you made a complete career change. So, I mean, Talk about like, like that, why the drive and then um, how hard has it been to get those, 
your clients on board or you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, so I had made, I made this kind of two shifts. So I made the shift um, to launching the agency itself in 2014, but 2020 was when I decided I really only want to work with brands that already get this. And in large part, that was because I was tired of having these fights. I was tired. Yeah, so you of, said goodbye to brands, right? You fired yes. clients, right? Yes. I fired, I did fire clients um, because you know, it just, it became where, you know, I'd be sitting there in meetings explaining this is why we have to do X, Y, and Z. And, um, you know, brands weren't willing to do it. And I knew that it weighed on me that they weren't willing to do it. Um, it made my job harder. It made me like waking up and doing my work less, but I also knew it wasn't good for them. I knew that it was going to end up hurting them. So it was kind of a double whammy. And I thought if I really just rebrand myself and put this forward, then I'm, people are going to know what they're getting right off the bat. And if they come to me and want me to represent them, they're going to understand that that's sort of a part of it. So that's now a piece of, um, you know, my intake on if I'm even going to have the conversation with someone about whether we work together is, yes. you know, what is your mission? What is your brand about asking those questions right up front and then deciding um, is it performative or not? Um, you know, and, and that's, you know, a little bit of due diligence has to be done on my side because, so many brands are just picking a thing and, you know, like, oh, we give 1% back to like whatever. Um, and that's, that's fine. I, I will take giving back in whatever capacity it comes. It's still, it's still all good for whoever's getting it. But ultimately I'm interested in working with brands that aren't just doing that little like piece just to check the box, but are actually willing to really talk about it in social. Um, because from those same numbers that I was reading earlier, another stat that I think is really important is that you can have all of those things as a brand, but unless you're talking about it everywhere, consumers don't buy it. And social media is arguably the most important place for you to be talking about it because that's you know where they're seeing it and really feeling like they're connecting with you personally. So in that sense, um, my job is easier because you know now I'm I feel like I'm contributing to hopefully some like good change in the world. Um, but my job is also a lot harder because I have to react very very quickly. So. If something happens in the world, which something happens in the world basically every day, but, you know, if if some controversial thing happens politically or there's, you know, normally politically these days, I have to make some really quick decisions of does it make sense for my brands to be addressing this in social? So, yeah. you know, most recently with rulings in Texas on abortion, um, Benefit was a brand that came out really, really strong and spoke out against it. Um, a lot of brands did it. So it's not going to make sense for every brand to do it, but for some brands, mm -hmm. it's it, the silence is deafening when they don't. So mm -hmm. you kind of have to already have a plan in place for where you're going to step forward and where your voice just isn't necessary to the conversation. So let's kind of adjust that. I'm going to see if I can open it up to all of you, right? That idea that... Um, you know, every brand has to take a stand on something. And does every brand have to take a stand? I mean, like, does every brand have to become, like, I'll, I'll reword it. What does every brand have to do regardless? Like, is it, does every brand now have to be using some sort of sustainable packaging? Is it required? Or do you think, no, not everybody has to? What do you guys think? I'll give you my lens and then I think PD people should definitely answer this question, but the lens I use with clients is looking at it like a Venn diagram. So if, if it is a founder um, at the front brand, sometimes I work with small brands where the founder is really involved, then it's a three-part Venn diagram. If not, then it's just two parts. But the first is if you're a founder, what, what really matters to you? Like what is your what are your values? What is like the thing that keeps you going? Um, then what does the brand stand for, which sometimes those overlap perfectly, sometimes it's like a little less. And then the last circle is what matters to your, what matters to your followers and your customers. And that little circle in the middle um, where it all intersects, like that's where like you have to say something. Mm -hmm. um, if it's outside of those, then, you know, you kind of get to decide. But if it's in the middle, if your customers really care about it, you as a founder care about it, and it's part of your brand DNA, it's weird if you don't say something. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you guys agree? Like, is, is it for you guys? Does it have to come from the company or does it come from with your own passion? And then you make, you're making the changes to put the brand here. Let's get, let's find this new package or let's find this new clean formula. Or is it coming from, from the owners and the founders to you? Yes. I think it, uh, uh, to following what Taryn said, it's the brand DNA and not only your brand but like your company like for example forma it's it that's sort of the umbrella and there's like 10 different brands and they it has to start at the top 
And I could have all these values and beliefs. And when I'm creating a product, I want it to be the, the cleanest, the most effective, the mo you know, the, the best of the best. But if we're not all aligned from the top, you know, that message will not go through, you know, to the shelves, to social media. Sometimes even now, like I'll, I'll go on, on our social media and I'm like, I put all those ingredients in there and they're not talking about them. That's, you know, and it's, it's, that's my, that's how I feel about it. You know, and there's still so much room for all of the brands to make improvements. And, you know, like the big word here, I think is pivot and we're all trying to pivot. And, you know, sometimes we find ourselves running around like chickens with our head cut off. And that's the reality of a lot of brands that are out there right now. And, you know, I feel that most brands, you know, in order to survive this change, they need to make sure they're authentic in every single part of their, their brand through their voice, social, through their product, through their packaging. And if they don't figure that out quickly, they're going to be left behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Melissa, how much is of your work now is, you know, um, I mean, Nick's, I, I'm not, I don't mean to pick on Nick's because I love Nick's. I think you guys are doing amazing work, but that's, I think you're sort of the epitome of the one where people are saying that, that, you know, you're not clean and yet you guys have a really strong message and you have a parent that's doing amazing, amazing things. So for you, from the marketing perspective, are you having, does that same passion come from the company to you or is it your passion going into the brand? Where do you come to be able to be able to talk meaningfully to your consumers about the things that they care about now? Absolutely. I think, you know, with working because it's not just NYX, right? It's L'Oreal is this big whole conglomerate like of a brand, right? Mm -hmm. So really it's L'Oreal's beliefs and ethics, right? That are kind of trickling down into each of our brands and my sister brands. And so really is how does NYX kind of differentiate ourselves, right? And really stay true to our brand DNA. Of course, we're getting always constantly pushed to be clean, but you know, we're also in our brand DNA about providing color and pro artistry. And that is very hard when it comes to product development, right? You're worried about pigmentation and, you know, quality. So, you know, it is all about making sure we're staying true to our roots, but also being like, once again, like authentic, you know, maybe have, like only a majority of our products are really clean and sustainable. Not that we're not trying to get there. It's just, we're trying to get there without losing who we are as a brand. Sure. Yeah. And, and it has to be believable, right? And that's the word authentic and meaningful. I mean, if you were all of a sudden doing it next week, go, guess what? NYX is now clean and green and, and all sustained. People would be like, exactly. what? <laughs> you know, and a lot of your loyal consumers are really dedicated to you because of your quality would even be going, wait, what did you do to my product? Right. Okay. And there's still that thought now. So, Sophia, you, you know, you're an incubator, right? So at this point, when new brands come to you guys, are you saying, look, let's start with this? Or um, is it a conversation you're having with brands now as they, they're kind of being hatched? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Since the very beginning, um, not only were brands and led founders or, or celebrity backed um, companies that were coming to us with ideas, we were always making sure that their ideas and their ideation align with the values of Hatch Beauty. And what that meant was we're going to take and create something, incubate it all the way, take it into market. But in between, how authentic are we going to be? You know, how meaningful is it going to be the way we create the messaging, the type of um, brand voice that we're creating for these brands or these products? So definitely it was it was a conversation that started since inception or prior to, to creating a, a partnership all the way through. And what was the most important thing is, do our values align with the vision of this founder, of this brand, of this product? Mm -hmm. So even as an incubator, you guys have to have your own set of values and Absolutely. your own set of beliefs, right? And so founding page, cool. All right, so let's kind of get to some of the nitty gritty. What are the skill sets that, that, that you guys think, um, that you women think are necessary now to succeed as this market changes? So, you know, maybe the skill sets that you needed first out of college, you know, 10 years ago or eight years ago, are they different now? Like, is there a different set of uh, skill sets you're looking for from the people you're hiring than maybe even you had expected of yourself? Well, I stumped them. Um, you know, I think it may, it may, maybe not a skill, 
what maybe it is, I think you have to be passionate, number one, uh, at whatever it is that you're doing in life. Um, you truly have to be passionate about what you do because then that will translate to your skills. Like it, it just will. Um, and I, you know, I, we keep saying it, pivot. And I just think, think like a chameleon, be like a chameleon, be ready to adapt and change. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, I get, you know, I get really hung up on like certain things that I, you know, certain products or certain ideas that I, that I have. And I want to say like, at least 50% of those, like they don't go as planned. So you have to be able to adapt, change and be okay with it. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's my right. so, But do you think the passions had to change? Like now, do, do, does a, a person just entering this industry have to have a passion for a cause as well, not just a passion for beauty? Totally, totally. I, I, I think so. And you have to find, you know, the brand that aligns with your values. That's super important. Otherwise, you're, you're going to be super unhappy. And, you know, I mean, like a paper pusher, like being doing whatever you're told to do versus creating and actually, you know, putting the innovation out there from your, um, your passion. And that's where great products come come to fruition. Um, so yeah. So, and Taryn, what skill set now for somebody who wants to go into your industry? I mean, come on, it wasn't the same skill set 10 years ago. Well, you know, I was thinking while you were talking, um, it, I feel like it actually kind of was to an extent. Um, you know, when I started again, 2000, this was a very long time ago, like a whole, some people on this call might not even have been born yet when I was starting. Um, but it was the same thing. I had to be able to really like jump in at that time, you know, these brands were tiny. When I joined Urban Decay, I was the ninth employee, Smashbox. I think I was number 13. Um, they were all very, very small. No one gave me a job description. You know, no one even really knew what the heck I was supposed to be doing. And it was up to me to just look around, figure it out, bob and weave and, um, you know, make it happen. So I think it's actually quite similar in that what I'm looking for now, um, I do bring on a lot of old students. Um, my, the first full-time hire I brought on was a student of mine. Um, my, my intern who just graduated that I am really excited to hopefully bring on full-time at some point um, is a student or was a student. And it's sort of like the same thing where they, they really just have to kind of be flexible and put on whatever hat is needed that day. But to Jasmine's point, I think caring about the mission of what I'm doing, that's, that's how it's doable because otherwise it would just be like, oh, I've got to create this post or I've got to do this analysis or this research. Like it's just, it's not that interesting unless there's something behind it really driving you that you think that you're making a difference. Because I, I do think that's a difference maybe, you know, from when I entered is um, I was allowed to be passionate about a brand or a product or a category, but I didn't have to be passionate about the cause of the brand. Yeah. Right? yeah. And I think that's the, you know, a, a, a significant shift now is that, you know, it, the values were, I cared about whether they, you know, treated their employees right. And I cared about whether or not they created formula that was still healthy and wasn't going to hurt anybody. But I didn't, I didn't get into the, what are the values? <laughs> you know? um, Sophia, I have a question here from David on the Q&A. And he said, what would you consider to be the most important skills to become a business owner in this generation? So since Hatch works with so many owners, what do you think in this, this now, when new owners come to you? What are the skills that you see that you can sit there and say, okay, I think this, this person might make it? That's a really good question. I think um, the biggest thing would be able to really embrace that entrepreneurial spirit and remain very fluid and allow to that space of co-creation because the founders are very close to their vision, right? And Did I lose everybody or just give life and breathe life into this vision and this stream? So it's definitely very important to, to embrace that kind of entrepreneurial fluidity spirit. Yeah, and I think co-creation is a very interesting thing to say, not that they need a co-partner, but I think you, you were right. There's a lot of founders who get very locked and they it's their vision and this is the way they're going to do it. And they're not open. And I love that open to fluidity, learn to go with the flow, to pivot, to change. You no, know, I love Jasmine's phrase, be a chameleon, right? Um, so excellent. All right. And then I'm going to just another question in here. And so what industry 
are our greatest allies in beauty. For example, the chemist science base, the researchers and environmentalists, doctors and skin technology developers, social and psychology based marketing, social conscious. Ed. So from that, um, what industry do you think is really behind helping the beauty industry achieve what it needs to achieve now? Is it going to be the R&D chemists? Is it going to be the manufacturers of componentry? Or is it going to be more um, the people who understand the psychology and the sociology behind the generations? I think it's going to be a good mix of everything that you just said. Um, I think for product, I think that it's going to um, go a little bit more science-based. I feel that, you know, dermatologists, I, I feel that most brands looking into the future, I feel they're really going to have some science to back them up. Um, and with that, it would be like dermatologist. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and Melissa, from a marketing perspective, like who is it that you get, you know, one of the questions here that I'm going to tie to the one prior is how are you staying informed about Gen Z's needs and demands, right? So who helps you from a marketing person be the person to stay ahead of this, stay, uh, stay in front of it, to understand what your consumer wants? Where are you getting that from? Absolutely. So it's going to be a little bit of a mixture of both our own internal marketing team, right? Just kind of being where they're at, really kind of researching and like what is resonating with them on these like different platforms. What posts had the most in terms of like high engagement that really worked. But then another thing what we're going to also be doing is working with our cross-functional market research team and housing focus groups, sitting down face-to-face -face with that Gen Z consumer, showing them images, showing them products. What do you like about it? what don't you like about it? Did this campaign resonate with you? If it did, great. Why? And if it didn't, what could we have done better? So it's really learning about what are their core values? Because, you know, like as Jasmine said, amazing, being a chameleon. So we really kind of have to adapt to what is it that they're looking for? So. Yeah, because I've been teaching the brand imaging class, right? And the thing what we teach in that class is trying to help the students figure out how to have a, have, have a brand, have a brand voice. And we talk about the storytelling behind that, right? And that you have to have a reason. And I think that's what you're all getting to, right? Is that core values, the core belief. And it's not just, I want to create a great eyeshadow, right? Which I think has been some of the issues with the influencers is they're just putting a product out that has their name on it. And they're not necessarily putting out a mission, right? And yet the other ones that are, that makes a difference, yeah? I mean, and to the point of, I only want to hire people that align with my vision. I only want to, you know, I create products that align with the vision. I market and speak to the consumer that aligns with my vision. So, and it's finding that, right? It's have, so is it that, do you find now that um, you target a specific consumer a lot more specifically than you used to? Like, instead of being everything to everybody, you're like, okay, we're going to speak just here and then let that overflow. Absolutely. I think the difference now is that we used to look at it as more of a like demographic view of like, how old is this person? You know, where does she live? All of those things. And now the consumer is just more varied than that. So we have to look at things more from a psychographic perspective and what they care about, I think is the best way to get in there because someone that cares about clean beauty could be, you know, it could be um, someone who's 12 or 13 and like just learning about beauty. Um, it could be my mom that had breast cancer that's now really worried about those things. Like those two women don't really have a lot in common um, aside from their interest in clean beauty. So it's kind of, I think getting in on psychographics has become more important than ever. Cool. All right. And then the one question I planted for all of you guys, right? Because it's not fair to ask this question without letting you think about it a little bit which is looking even further ahead into your crystal ball. What do you see as the next big shift? Okay, so this sustainable, this diverse, this, this has been a significant shift. And I'm gonna say you answered it, it's a shift. It's not a trend. It is a shift. What do you think is the next big shift? And when do you think we may start to get there? Who wants to go first? Melissa? I go first, yeah. <laughs> um, definitely. So for us, it really is all about bringing forth that experience, like experiential, like kind of like full 360 experience 
in store. So mm -hmm. really kind of taking that storytelling that we're doing from an O to O perspective, online to o to o. online to offline perspective, right? Yep. And bringing that forth in store. So it's an experience, right? And so whether that be in two to three years or three to five years from now, we're incorporating virtual reality, right? Mm -hmm. So where you're actually can pull out your phone and have a one-on-one -on -one uh, consult with uh, somebody to help you uh, figure out like what your perfect lipstick shade is or having that VTO of just doing it yourself or you know even shopping in store that maybe they don't have my shade but it could be delivered to my house tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I really think it is all about bringing forth that digital presence to mm -hmm. more in-store and making an experience. No, oh, I too. That's exciting. And I, you know what, as you're saying it, I'm like, oh my God. And I could so see Mix do this, right? This is just like, I could so you be the leader on that because that's the, that's the brand I would want to interact with. Yeah. You know, it was a brand that I would think would be fun and energetic and engaging. Um, yeah. So, oh, I, woo, do you think that's going to happen in your lifetime? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah? All right. <laughs> oh, we got a little clue there. Okay. <laughs> and Sophia, do you want to go next? Sure. I think to add to what Melissa had said, I think bridging the gap between the digital world and the meta metaverse. And what I mean by that is like to create the virtual enhanced physical reality beyond digital, including social and AI. I think after experiencing a global health crisis, our sense of community and belonging has exponentially grown. So really delivering that experience where it's just you're submerged in it, you know? So that's definitely something that it's slowly happening, but it's really going to take off in the very near future. So I'm excited to see that. And is that an external vendor doing that? Or do you guys see that as being something the brands themselves can do? Um, I can only answer this. We're currently working with a third-party AI vendor that's kind of prototyping this type of experience and that's all I can share at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. well that's, you know, my, and that's it, isn't it? It's These things can happen when the companies come around with the technology to do it, sort of what Kenya was asking about, right? The other, who's supporting you to, to go to the next step. All right, Taryn, what do you got? I have two and one's already kind of been touched on, which is AI. And I think the, the extra piece on that that maybe is not as consumer facing is the amount of data that we will have that we will be able to use, I think, in formulation to kind of predict what people's skin needs. So, you know, now we have like continuity programs, for example, um, where I just get that same thing every month. You know, Amazon's like, oh, you need a new one of these. But I don't need a new one of those every month because my skin is different and it goes through different things. So I think the data that we're going to have available is going to allow for us to get much more targeted um, experiences. But the one that's maybe a little less fun to think about, um, and I think people in PD will have more to say on this, is we're, we're entering a time when resources are really going to change. And when I was in PD, I remember the struggles if, if an essential ingredient was out of stock or, you know, whatever, and we would have to reformulate. But that didn't happen very often. And I think it's going to be more of an issue. Um, the UN is predicting that two thirds of the world is going to be experiencing water scarcity by 2025. So that's not far away. That's like a few years from now. Um, Skincare uses a lot of water, both on like me using my skincare, but also production of skincare. Care so, too. yeah. So I think there's going to be a lot of shifts on the PD side as you know brands have to get really, really creative on how they keep up the level of quality when they can't formulate quite the same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I love that. All right, Jasmine. Yeah, I I think it's a, a touching on Taryn's point on um, the scarcity of you know, our resources is going to be huge. And I think um, kind of like the pull-up challenge, I think that for brands and for um, the next, I mean, it's my crystal ball. Um, I think that the next step is going to be more transparency to the point where not giving away your formula, you know, your, your whole ingredients and your all of your uh, your percentages, but to a certain degree, I feel like that's where it's going to go next to truly show that you are doing the best that you can, because as you know, um, you know, I, 
I think there's a term that we use and it's called skin suticals and it's all those Gen Z's that, you know, that are smarter than I am when it comes to skincare. I learned from them, like it's crazy. And, you know, they're, they're, these consumers are so smart and you can't fool them anymore. You know, adding those ingredients that are, you know, the fun, you know, beautiful ingredients, they know that if they're at the bottom of the list, that they're probably at such a low level. And even for me as a developer right now, something that, you know, I'm starting to do and I feel like it'll keep going as a, as the time goes on is like, I need to make sure that I'm putting the percentage of, of the ingredient that where it's efficacious and that it's, that it's proven. And I, we're not, we're not going to say that, you know, just yet, but I feel like that's where it's going to go. So that now word we didn't mention yet, transparency, right? That's where we're going. And I don't think that will be a trend either. So uh, ladies, it has been so much fun and so amazing to talk to you. And you all have such great perspectives. And I'm extremely proud because you are truly the future of this industry. And that's just the goal of this program is to put people out that are going to make a change and make a difference and influence. It's why Terrence come back to teach. Right. Um, and so, and you, you all four of you are true representations of how fabulous you, you, you are and you tech this industry and you're making a difference and making a change. And I can only thank you for that. And thank you for being here today um, to share that vision with everybody. So um, I love you all. And I hope everybody here had a great time um, and enjoyed yourselves and reach out on social to our panelists. They're all on there somewhere on LinkedIn. I know it. Um, and, you know, anybody who wants to share their, uh, their information in chat, then go ahead. All right. Oh, and then I'm being prompted, right? It's Fashion Club Day on September 25th um, in the Grand Hope Park and the Fitham Open House on October 23rd, also in the park. So hopefully we see you all in person. Yeah, thanks, Taryn, for sharing that. So everybody follow Taryn. All right. Thank you, everybody. Take care.